Chapter 4 The morning after the bridge party, Mrs. Van Hopper woke with a sore throat and a temperature of 102. I rang up her doctor who came round at once and diagnosed the usual influenza. You're to stay in bed until I allow you to get up, he told her. I don't like the sound of that heart of yours, and it won't get better unless you keep perfectly quiet and still. I should prefer, he went on, turning to me, that Mrs. Van Hopper had a trained nurse. You can't possibly lift her. It'll only be for a fortnight or so. I thought this rather absurd and protested, but to my surprise she agreed with him. I think she enjoyed the fuss it would create, the sympathy of people, the visits and messages from friends and the arrival of flowers. Monte Carlo had begun to bore her, and this little illness would make a distraction. The nurse would give her injections and a light massage, and she would have a diet. I left her quite happy after the arrival of the nurse, propped up on pillows with a falling temperature, her best bed jacket round her shoulders, and the beribboned boudoir cap upon her head. Rather ashamed of my light heart, I telephoned her friends, putting off the small party she had arranged for the evening, and went down to the restaurant for lunch, a good half an hour before our usual time. I expected the room to be empty. Nobody lunched generally before one o'clock. It was empty, except for the table next to ours. This was a contingency for which I was unprepared. I thought he had gone to Sospel. No doubt he was lunching early, because he hoped to avoid us at one o'clock. I was already halfway across the room and could not go back. I had not seen him since we disappeared in the lift the day before for wisely he had avoided dinner in the restaurant, possibly for the same reason that he lunched early now. It was a situation for which I was ill-trained. I wished I was older, different. I went to our table, looking straight before me, and immediately paid the penalty of my gaucherie by knocking over the vase of stiff anemones as I unfolded my napkin. The water soaked the cloth and ran down onto my lap, The waiter was at the other end of the room, nor had he seen. In a second, though, my neighbour was by my side, dry napkin in hand. You can't sit on a wet tablecloth, he said brusquely. It'll put you off your food. Get out of the way. He began to mop the cloth, while the waiter, seeing the disturbance, came swiftly to the rescue. I don't mind, I said. It doesn't matter a bit. I'm all alone. He said nothing and then the waiter arrived and whipped away the vase and the sprawling flowers. Leave that, he said suddenly, and lay another place at my table. Mademoiselle will have luncheon with me. I looked up in confusion. Oh, oh no, I said. I couldn't possibly. Why not, he said. I tried to think of an excuse. I knew he didn't want to lunch with me. It was his form of courtesy. I should ruin his meal. I determined to be bold and speak the truth. Please, I begged, don't be polite. It's very kind of you, but I shall be quite all right if the waiter just wipes the cloth. But I'm not being polite, he insisted. I would like you to have luncheon with me, even if you hadn't knocked over that vase so clumsily, I should have asked you. I suppose my face told him my doubt, for he smiled. You don't believe me, he said. Never mind. Come, sit down. We needn't uh, talk to each other unless we feel like it. We sat down and he gave me the menu, leaving me to choose and went on with his hors d'oeuvre as though nothing had happened. His quality of detachment was peculiar to himself, and I knew that we might continue thus, without speaking, throughout the meal, and it wouldn't matter. There would be no sense of strain. He would not ask me questions on history. What's happened to your friend? he said. I told him about the influenza. I'm so sorry, he said, and then, after pausing a moment, you got my note, I suppose. I felt very much ashamed of myself. My manners were atrocious. The only excuse I can make is that I have become boorish through living alone. That's why it's kind of you to lunch with me today. You weren't rude, 
I said, Elise, not the sort of rudeness she would understand. That uh, curiosity of hers. She doesn't mean to be offensive, but she does it to everyone. That is, everyone of importance. I ought to be flattered then, he said. Why should she consider me of any importance? I hesitated a moment before replying. I think it was because of Mandalay. He didn't answer and I was aware again of that feeling of discomfort as though I had trespassed on forbidden ground. I wondered why it was that this home of his, known to so many people by hearsay, even to me, should so inevitably silence him, making, as it were, a barrier between him and others. We ate for a while without talking, and I thought of a picture postcard. I bought once at a village shop when on holiday as a child in the West Country. It was the painting of a house, crudely done, of course, and highly coloured, but even those faults could not destroy the symmetry of the building, the wide stone steps before the terrace, the green lawns stretching to the sea. I paid tuppence for the painting, half my weekly pocket money, and then asked the wrinkled shopwoman what it was meant to be. She looked astonished at my ignorance. That's Manderley, she said, and I remember coming out of the shop feeling rebuffed yet hardly wiser than before. Perhaps it was the memory of this postcard, lost long ago in some forgotten book, that made me sympathise with his defensive attitude. He resented Mrs. Van Hopper and her like with their intruding questions. Maybe there was something inviolate about Mandalay that made it a place apart. It would not bear discussion. I could imagine her tramping through the rooms, perhaps paying sixpence for admission ripping the quietude with her sharp staccato laugh. Our minds must have run in the same channel, for he began to talk about her. Your friend, uh, he began. She's uh, very much older than you. Is she a relation? Have you known her long? I saw he was still puzzled by us. Yeah, she's not really a friend, I told him. She's an employer. She's training me to be a thing called a companion, and she pays me ninety pounds a year. I didn't know one could buy companionship, he said. It sounds a primitive idea, rather like the eastern slave market. I looked up the word companion once in the dictionary, I admitted, and, and it said a companion is a friend of the bosom. You haven't very much in common with her, he said. He laughed, looking quite different, younger somehow and less detached. What do you do it for? he asked me. Ninety pounds is a lot of money to me, I said. Haven't you any family? No, they're dead. You have a very lovely and unusual name. My father was a lovely and unusual person. Tell me about him, he said. I looked at him over my glass of citronade. It was not easy to explain my father, and usually I never talked about him. It was my secret property, preserved for me alone, much as Mandalay was preserved for my neighbour. I had no wish to introduce him casually over a table in a Monte Carlo restaurant. There was a strange air of unreality about that luncheon, and looking back upon it now, it is invested for me with a curious glamour. There was I, so much of a schoolgirl still, who only the day before had sat with Mrs. Van Hopper, prim, silent and subdued and twenty-four hours afterwards my family history was mine no longer. I shared it with a man I did not know. For some reason I felt impelled to speak, because his eyes followed me in sympathy like the gentleman unknown. My shyness fell away from me, loosening as it did so my reluctant tongue, and out they all came, the little secrets of childhood, the pleasures and the pains. It seemed to me as though... He understood, from my poor description, something of the vibrant personality that had been my father's, and something, too, of the love my mother had for him, making it a vital living force, with a spark of divinity about it, so much that when he died that desperate winter, struck down by pneumonia, she lingered behind him for five short weeks, and stayed no more. I remember pausing, a little breathless. A little dazed. The restaurant was now filled with people who chatted and laughed to an orchestral background and a clatter of plates, and glancing at the clock above the door, I saw that it was two o'clock, 
We had been sitting there an hour and a half, and the conversation had been mine alone. I tumbled down into reality, hot-handed and self-conscious, with my face aflame, and began to stammer my apologies. He wouldn't listen to me. I told you at the beginning of lunch you had a lovely and unusual name, he said. I shall go further, if you'll forgive me, and say that it becomes you as well as it became your father. I've enjoyed this hour with you more than I have enjoyed anything for a very long time. You've taken me out of myself, out of despondency and introspection, both of which have been my devils for a year. I looked at him and believed he spoke the truth. He seemed less fettered than he had been before, more modern, more human. He was not hemmed in by shadows. You know, he said, we've got a bond in common, you and I. We're both alone in the world, oh, got a sister, though we don't see much of each other, and an ancient grandmother whom I pay duty visits to three times a year, but neither of them make for companionship. I shall have to congratulate Mrs. Van Hopper. You're cheap at ninety pounds a year. You forget, I said, you have a home, and I have none. The moment I spoke I regretted my words the secret, inscrutable look came back in his eyes again, and once again I suffered the intolerable discomfort that floods back to one after a lack of tact. He bent his head to light a cigarette and did not reply immediately. An empty house can be as lonely as a full hotel, he said at length. The trouble is that it is less impersonal, he hesitated and for a moment I thought he was going to talk of Mandalay at last, but something held him back, some phobia that struggled to the surface of his mind and won supremacy, for he blew out his match and his flash of confidence at the same time. So the friend of the bosom has a holiday, he said, on a level plane again, an easy camaraderie between us. What does she propose to do with it? I thought of the cobbled square in Monaco and the house with the narrow window. I could be off there by three o'clock with my sketchbook and pencil, and I told him as much, a little shyly perhaps, like all untalented persons with a pet hobby. I'll drive you there in the car, he said, and wouldn't listen to protests. I remembered Mrs. Van Hopper's warning of the night before about putting myself forward, and was embarrassed that he might think my talk of Monaco was a subterfuge to win a lift. It was so blatantly the type of thing that she would do herself, and I didn't want him to bracket us together. I had already risen in importance from my lunch with him, for as we got up from the table, the little maître d'hôtel rushed forward to pull away my chair. He bowed and smiled, a total change from his usual attitude of indifference, picked up my handkerchief that had fallen on the floor, and hoped Mademoiselle had enjoyed her lunch. Even the page boy by the swing doors glanced at me with respect. My companion accepted it as natural, of course. He knew nothing of the ill-carved ham of yesterday. I found the change depressing. It made me despise myself. I remembered my father and his scorn of superficial snobbery. What are you thinking about? We were walking along the corridor to the lounge, and looking up I saw his eyes fixed on me in curiosity. Has something annoyed you? he said. The attentions of the maître d'hôtel had opened up a train of thought, and as we drank coffee I told him about Blaze, the dressmaker. She had been so pleased when Mrs. Van Hopper had bought three frocks, and I, taking her to the lift afterwards, had pictured her working upon them in her own small salon, behind a stuffy little shop, with a consumptive son wasting upon her sofa. I could see her, with tired eyes threading needles and the floor covered with snippets of material. Well, he said, smiling, wasn't your picture true? I don't know, I said. I never found out. And I told him how I had rung the bell for the lift, and as I had done so she had fumbled in her bag and gave me a note for a hundred francs. Here, she had whispered, a tone intimate and unpleasant, I want you to accept this small commission in return for bringing your patron to my shop. When I had refused, scarlet with embarrassment, she had shrugged her shoulders disagreeably. Just as you like, she had said, but I assure you it's quite usual. Perhaps you would rather have a frock, 
Come along to the shop sometime without madame, and I will fix you up without charging you a sou. Somehow, I didn't know why, I had been aware of that sick, unhealthy feeling I had experienced as a child when turning the pages of a forbidden book. The vision of the consumptive son faded, and in its stead arose the picture of myself, had I been different, pocketing that greasy note with an understanding smile, and perhaps slipping round to Blaze's shop on this my free afternoon, and coming away with a frock I had not paid for. I expected him to laugh. It was a stupid story. I don't know why I told him, but he looked at me thoughtfully as he stirred his coffee. I think you've made a big mistake, he said after a moment. In refusing that hundred francs, I asked, revolted. No, good heavens, what do you take me for? I think you've made a mistake in coming here, in joining forces with Mrs. Van Hopper. You're not made for that sort of job. You're too young for one thing, and too soft. Blaze at her commission, that's nothing, the first of many similar incidents from other blazes. You'll either have to give in and become a sort of blaze yourself, or stay as you are and be broken. Who suggested you took on this thing in the first place? It seemed natural for him to question me, nor did I mind. It was as though we had known one another for a long time, and had met again after a lapse of years. Have you ever thought about the future? he asked me, and what this sort of thing will lead to. Supposing Mrs. Van Hopper gets tired of her friend of the bosom, what then? I smiled and told him that I didn't mind very much. There would be other Mrs. Van Hoppers, and I was young and confident and strong. But even as he spoke, I remembered those advertisements seen often in good-class magazines where a friendly society demands succour for young women in reduced circumstances. I thought of the type of boarding-house that answers the advertisement and gives temporary shelter, and then I saw myself, useless sketchbook in hand, without qualifications of any kind, stammering replies to stern employment agents. Perhaps I should have accepted Blaze's ten per cent. How old are you? he said, and when I told him he laughed and got up from his chair. I know that age. It's a particularly obstinate one, and a thousand bogies won't make you fear the future. Pity we can't change over. Go upstairs and put your hat on, and I'll have the car brought round. As he watched me into the lift, I thought of yesterday, Mrs. Van Hopper's chattering tongue and his cold courtesy. I had ill-judged him. He was neither hard nor sardonic. He was already my friend of many years, the brother I had never possessed. Mine was a happy mood that afternoon, and I remember it well. I can see the rippled sky fluffy with cloud and the white-whipped sea. I can feel again the wind on my face and hear my laugh and his that echoed it. It was not the Monte Carlo I had known, or perhaps the truth was, that it pleased me better. There was a glamour about it that it had not been before. I must have looked upon it before with dull eyes. The harbour was a dancing thing with fluttering paper boats, and the sailors on the quay were jovial, smiling fellows, merry as the wind. We passed the yacht beloved of Mrs. Van Hopper because of its ducal owner, and snapped our fingers at the glistening brass, and looked at one another and laughed again. I can remember as though I wore it still, my comfortable, ill-fitting flannel suit, and how the skirt was lighter than the coat through harder wear. My shabby hat, too broad about the brim, and my low-heeled shoes fastened with a single strap. A pair of gauntlet gloves clutched in a grubby hand. I had never looked more youthful. I had never felt so old. Mrs. Van Hopper and her influenza did not exist for me. The bridge and the cocktail parties were forgotten, and with them my own humble status. I was a person of importance. I was grown up at last. That girl who, tortured by shyness, would stand outside the sitting-room door, twisting a handkerchief in her hands, while from within came that babble of confused chatter so unnerving to the intruder. She had gone with the wind that afternoon. She was a poor creature, and I thought of her with scorn, if I considered her at all. The wind was too high for sketching. It tore in cheerful gusts around the corner of my cobbled square 
and back to the car we went and drove. I know not where. The long road climbed the hills, and the car climbed with it, and we circled in the heights like a bird in the air. How different his car to Mrs. Van Hopper's hireling for the season, a square old-fashioned daimler that took us to Mentone on placid afternoons, when I, sitting on the little seat with my back to the driver, must crane my neck to see the view. This car had the wings of mercury, I thought, for higher yet we climbed, and dangerously fast, and the danger pleased me because it was new to me, because I was young. I remember laughing aloud and the laugh being carried by the wind away from me. And looking at him, I realised he laughed no longer. He was once more silent and detached, the man of yesterday, wrapped in his secret self. I realised, too, that the car could climb no more. We had reached the summit, and below us stretched the way we had come, precipitous and hollow. He stopped the car and I could see that the edge of the road bordered a vertical slope that crumbled into vacancy, a fall of perhaps two thousand feet. We got out of the car and looked beneath us. This sobered me at last. I knew that but half the car's length had lain between us and the fall. The sea, like a crinkled chart, spread to the horizon and lapped the sharp outline of the coast, while the houses were white shells in a rounded grotto pricked here and there by a great orange sun. We knew another sunlight on our hill, and the silence made it harder, more austere. A change had come upon our afternoon. It was not the thing of gossamer it had been. The wind dropped, and it suddenly grew cold. When I spoke, my voice was far too casual, the silly, nervous voice of someone ill at ease. Do, do you know this place? I said. Have you been here before? He looked down at me without recognition, and I realised with a little stab of anxiety that he must have forgotten all about me, perhaps for some considerable time, and that he himself was so lost in the labyrinth of his own unquiet thoughts that I did not exist. He had the face of one who walks in his sleep, and for a wild moment the idea came to me that perhaps he was not normal, not altogether sane. There were people who had trances, I had surely heard of them, and they followed strange laws of which we could know nothing. They obeyed the tangled orders of their own subconscious minds. Perhaps he was one of them, and here we were, within six feet of death. It's getting late. Shall we go home? I said, and my careless tone, my little ineffectual smile would scarcely have deceived a child. I had misjudged him, of course. There was nothing wrong after all for as soon as I spoke the second time, he came clear of his dream and began to apologise. I had gone white, I suppose, and he had noticed it. That was an unforgivable thing for me to do, he said, and taking my arm he pushed me back towards the car, and we climbed in again, and he slammed the door. Don't be frightened, uh, the turn is far easier than it looks, he said, and while I, sick and giddy, clung to the seat with both hands, he manoeuvred the car gently, very gently, until it faced the sloping road once more. Then you have been here before, I said to him, my sense of strain departing. The car crept away down the twisting narrow road. Yes, he said, and then, after pausing a moment, but not for many years, I wanted to see if it had changed. And has it? I asked. No, he said. No, it hasn't changed. I wondered what had driven him to this retreat into the past with me an unconscious witness of his mood. What gulf of years stretched between him and that other time? What deed of thought and action? What difference in temperament? I didn't want to know. I wished I hadn't come. Down the twisting road we went, without a check, without a word, a great ridge of cloud stretched above the setting sun, and the air was cold and clean. Suddenly, he began to talk about Mandalay. He said nothing of his life there, no word about himself, but he told me how the sun set there on a spring afternoon, leaving a glow upon the headland. The sea would look like slate, cold still from the long winter, and from the terrace you could hear the ripple of the coming tide washing in the little bay. The daffodils were in bloom, stirring in the evening breeze, 
golden heads cupped upon lean stalks, and however many you might pick, there will be no thinning of the ranks. They were massed like an army, shoulder to shoulder. On a bank below the lawns, crocuses were planted, golden, pink, and mauve. But by this time they would be past their best, dropping and fading like pallid snowdrops. The primrose was more vulgar, a homely, pleasant creature who appeared in every cranny like a weed. Too early yet for bluebells, their heads were still hidden beneath last year's leaves, but when they came, dwarfing the more humble violet, they choked the very bracken in the woods, and their colour made a challenge to the sky. He never would have them in the house, he said. Thrust into vases they became dank and listless, and to see them at their best you must walk in the woods in the morning, about twelve o'clock, when the sun was overhead. They had a smoky, a rather bitter smell, as though a wild sap ran in their stalks, pungent and juicy. People who plucked bluebells from the woods were vandals. He had forbidden it at Mandalay. Sometimes, driving in the country, he had seen bicyclists with huge bunches strapped before them on the handles, the bloom already fading from the dying heads, the ravaged stalks straggling, naked and unclean. The primrose didn't mind it quite so much. Although a creature of the wilds, it had a leaning towards civilization and preened and smiled in the jam jar in some cottage window, without resentment, living quite a week if given water. No wild flowers came in the house at Mandalay. He had special cultivated flowers grown for the house alone in the walled garden. A rose was one of the few flowers, he said, that looked better picked than growing. A bowl of roses in a drawing room had the depth of colour and scent they had not possessed in the open. There was something rather blousy about roses in full bloom, something shallow and raucous, like women with untidy hair. In the house they became mysterious and subtle. He had roses in the house at Mandalay for eight months in the year. Did I like Syringa? he asked me. There was a tree on the edge of the lawn he could smell from his bedroom window. His sister, who was a hard, rather practical person, used to complain that there were too many scents at Mandalay. They made her drunk. Perhaps she was right. He didn't care. It was the only form of intoxication that appealed to him. His earliest recollection was of great branches of lilac standing in white jars, and they filled the house with a wistful, poignant smell. The little pathway down the valley to the bay had clumps of azalea and rhododendron planted to the left of it, and if he wandered down it on a May evening after dinner, it was just as though the shrubs had sweated in the air. You could stoop down and pick a fallen petal, crush it between your fingers, and you had there in the hollow of your hand, the essence of a thousand scents, unbearable and sweet, all from a curled and crumpled petal. And you came out of the valley, heady and rather dazed, to the hard white shingle of the beach and the still water, a curious, perhaps too sudden contrast. As he spoke, the car became one of many once again. Dusk had fallen without my noticing it and we were in the midst of light and sound in the streets of Monte Carlo. The clatter jagged on my nerves, and the lights were far too brilliant, far too yellow. It was a swift, unwelcome anticlimax. Soon we would come to the hotel, and I felt for my gloves in the pocket of the car. I found them, and my fingers closed upon a book as well, whose slim covers told of poetry. I peered to read the title as the car slowed down before the door of the hotel. You can take and read it if you like, he said, his voice casual and indifferent now that the drive was over and we were back again, and Mandalay was many hundreds of miles distant. I was glad and held it tightly with my gloves. I felt I wanted some possession of his, now that the day was finished. Hop out, he said. I must go and put the car away. I, I shan't see you in the restaurant this evening as I'm dining out, but thank you for today. I went up the hotel steps alone with all the despondency of a child whose treat is over. My afternoon had spoilt me for the hours it still remained, and I thought how long they would seem until my bedtime. How empty, too, my supper all alone. Somehow I could not face the bright inquiries of the nurse upstairs, 
or the possibilities of Mrs. Van Hopper's husky interrogation, so I sat down in the corner of the lounge behind a pillar and ordered tea. The waiter appeared bored. Seeing me alone, there was no need for him to press, and anyway, it was at dragging time of day, a few minutes after half-past five, when the non tea is finished and the Arthur drinks remote. Rather forlorn, more than a little dissatisfied, I leaned back in my chair and took up the book of poems. The volume was well-worn, well-thumbed, falling open automatically at what must be a much-frequented page. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears I hid from him. And under running laughter, up vistaed slopes I sped and shot, precipitated adown titanic glooms of chasmed fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after. I felt rather like someone peering through the keyhole of a locked door, and a little furtively I laid the book aside. What hound of heaven had driven him to the high hills this afternoon? I thought of his car, with half a length between it and that drop of two thousand feet, the blank expression on his face. What footsteps echoed in his mind, what whispers, and what memories, and why, of all poems, must he keep this one in the pocket of his car? I wished he were less remote, and I anything but the creature that I was in my shabby coat and skirt, my broad-brimmed schoolgirl hat. The sulky waiter brought my tea, and while I ate bread and butter and dull as sawdust, I thought of the pathway through the valley he had described to me this afternoon, the smell of the azaleas, the white shingle of the bay. If he loved it all so much, why did he seek the superficial froth of Monte Carlo? He had told Mrs. Van Hopper he had made no plans, he came away in rather a hurry, and I pictured him running down that pathway in the valley with his own hound of heaven at his heels. I picked up the book again, and this time it opened at the title page, and I read the dedication. Max, from Rebecca, 17th May written in a curious slanting hand. A little blob of ink marred the white page opposite, as though the writer, in impatience, had shaken her pen to make the ink flow freely. And then, as it bubbled through the nib, it came a little thick, so that the name Rebecca stood out black and strong, the tall and sloping R dwarfing the other letters. I shut the book with a snap and put it away under my gloves and stretching to a nearby chair, I took up an old copy of illustration and turned the pages. There were some fine photographs of the chateau of the Loire, and an article as well. I read it carefully, referring to the photographs, but when I finished, I knew I had not understood a word. It was not Blois with its thin turrets and its spires that stared up at me from the printed page. It was the face of Mrs. Van Hopper, in the restaurant the day before, her small pig's eyes darting to the neighbouring table, her fork heaped high with ravioli, pausing mid-air. An appalling tragedy, she was saying. The papers were full of it, of course. They say he never talks about it, never mentions her name. She was drowned, you know, in the bay, near Mandalay. Chapter 5 I'm glad it cannot happen twice the fever of first love, for it is a fever, and a burden too, whatever the poets say. They are not brave the days when we are twenty-one. They are full of little cowardices, little fears without foundation, and one is so easily bruised, so swiftly wounded, one falls to the first barbed word. Today, wrapped in the complacent armour of approaching middle age, the infinitesimal pricks of day by day brush one lightly and are soon forgotten. But then, how a careless word would linger becoming a fiery stigma, and how a look, a glance over a shoulder, branded themselves as things eternal. A denial heralded the thrice crowing of a cock, and an insincerity was like the kiss of Judas. The adult mind can lie with an untroubled conscience and a gay composure, but in those days, even a small deception scarred the tongue, 
lashing one against the stake itself. What have you been doing this morning? I can hear her now propped against her pillows with all the small irritability of the patient who's not really ill and who has lain in bed too long. An eye reaching to the bedside drawer for the pack of cards would feel the guilty flush form patches on my neck. I've been playing tennis with the professional, I told her, the false words bringing me to panic even as I spoke. But what if the professional himself could come up to the suite then, that very afternoon, and bursting in upon her complain that I had missed my lesson now for many days? The trouble is, with me laid up like this, you haven't got enough to do, she said, mashing her cigarette in a jar of cleansing cream. And taking the cards in her hand, she mixed them in the deft, irritating shuffle of the inveterate player, shaking them in threes, snapping the backs. I don't know what you find to do with yourself all day, she went on. You never have any sketches to show me, and when I do ask you to do some shopping for me, you forget to buy my tax or... All I can say is that I hope your tennis will improve. It'll be useful to you later on. A poor player is a great poor. Do you still serve underhand? She flipped the queen of spades into the pool, and the dark face stared up at me like Jezebel. Yes, I said, stung by her question, thinking how just and appropriate her word. It described me well. I was underhand. I had not played tennis with the professional at all, I had not once played since she had lain in bed, and that was a little over a fortnight now. I wondered why it was I clung to this reserve, and why it was I didn't tell her that every morning I drove with De Winter in his car, and lunched with him too, at his table in the restaurant. You must come up to the net more. You'll never play a good game until you do, she continued, and I agreed, flinching at my own hypocrisy covering the queen with the weak-chinned knave of hearts. I have forgotten much of Monte Carlo, of those morning drives, of where we went, even our conversation. But I have not forgotten how my fingers trembled, cramming on my hat, and how I ran along the corridor and down the stairs, too impatient to wait for the slow whining of the lift, and so outside, brushing the swing doors before the commissionaire could help me. He would be there, in the driver's seat, reading a paper while he waited. And when he saw me, he would smile and toss it behind him in the back seat and open the door, saying, Well, how's the friend of the bosom this morning? And where does she want to go? If he had driven round in circles, it wouldn't have mattered to me. For I was in that first flushed stage, when to climb into the seat beside him and lean forward to the windscreen hugging my knees was almost too much to bear. I was like a little scrubby schoolboy with a passion for a sixth form prefect, and he, kinder, and far more inaccessible. There's a cold wind this morning, you'd better put on my coat. I remember that, for I was young enough to win happiness in the wearing of his clothes, playing the schoolboy again who carries his hero's sweater and ties it about his throat, choking with pride, and this borrowing of his coat, wearing it around my shoulders for even a few minutes at a time, was a triumph in itself and made a glow about my morning. Not for me the languor and the subtlety I had read about in books, the challenge and the chase, the sword play, the swift glance, the stimulating smile. The art of provocation was unknown to me, and I would sit with his map upon my lap, the wind blowing my dull, lanky hair happy in his silence, yet eager for his words. Whether he talked or not made little difference to my mood. My only enemy was the clock on the dashboard whose hands would move relentlessly to one o'clock. We drove east, we drove west, amidst the myriad villages that cling like limpets to the Mediterranean shore, and today I remember none of them. All I remember is the feel of the leather seats, the texture of the map upon my knee, its frayed edges, its worn seams, and how one day, looking at the clock, I thought to myself, this moment now, at twenty past eleven, this must never be lost, and I shut my eyes to make the experience more lasting. When I opened my eyes, we were by a bend in the road, and a peasant girl in a black shawl waved to us. I can see her now, a dusty skirt, a gleaming, friendly smile, and in a second we had passed the bend, I could see her no more. Already she belonged to the past. She was only a memory. I wanted to go back again, 
to recapture the moment that had gone. And then it came to me that if we did, it would not be the same. Even the sun would be changed in the sky, casting another shadow, and the peasant girl would trudge past us along the road in a different way, not waving this time, perhaps not even seeing us. There was something chilling in the thought, something a little melancholy, and looking at the clock I saw that five more minutes had gone by. Soon we would have reached our time limit and must return to the hotel. If only there could be an invention, I said impulsively, that bottled up memory like scent, and it never faded, and it never got stale, and then, when one wanted it, the bottle could be uncorked, and it would be like living the moment all over again. I looked up at him to see what he would say. He did not turn to me. He went on watching the road ahead. What particular moments in your young life do you wish uncorked, he said. I couldn't tell from his voice whether he was teasing me or not. I, I'm not sure, I began, and then blundered on, rather foolishly, not thinking of my words. I'd like to keep this moment, and never forget it. Is that meant to be a compliment to the day, or to my driving, he said. And as he laughed like a mocking brother, I became silent, overwhelmed suddenly by the great gulf between us, and how his very kindness to me widened it. I knew then that I would never tell Mrs. Van Hopper about these morning expeditions, for her smile would hurt me as his laugh had done. She would not be angry, nor would she be shocked. She would raise her eyebrows very faintly, as though she didn't altogether believe my story, and then, with a tolerant shrug of the shoulder, she would say, My dear child, it's extremely sweet and kind of him to take you driving. The only thing is, are you sure it doesn't bore him dreadfully. And then she would send me out to buy tax or patting me on the shoulder. What degradation lay in being young, I thought, and felt tearing my nails. I wish, I said savagely, still mindful of his laugh and throwing discretion to the wind. I wish I was a woman of about thirty-six, dressed in black satin with a string of pearls. You wouldn't be in this car with me if you were, he said. And stop biting those nails, they're ugly enough already. You'll think me impertinent and rude, I dare say, I went on. But I would like to know why you ask me to come out in the car day after day. You've been kind, that's obvious. But why do you choose me for your charity? I sat up stiff and straight in my seat with all the poor pomposity of youth. I ask you, he said gravely, because you are not dressed in black satin with a string of pearls. Nor are you thirty-six. His face was without expression. I couldn't tell whether he laughed inwardly or not. It's all very well, I said. You know everything there is to know about me. There's not much, I admit, because I've not been alive for very long. Nothing much has happened to me except people dying. But you, I know nothing more about you than I did the first day we met. And what did you know then? he asked. What, why, that you lived at Mandalay and, and that you'd lost your wife. There. I had said it at last, the word that had hovered on my tongue for days your wife. It came out with ease, without reluctance, as though the mere mention of her must be the most casual thing in all the world. Your wife. The word lingered in the air once I had uttered it, dancing before me, and because he received it silently, making no comment, the word magnified itself into something heinous and appalling, a forbidden word, unnatural to the tongue, and I could not call it back. It could never be unsaid. Once again I saw the inscription on the flyleaf of that book of poems, and the curious slanting R. I felt sick at heart and cold. He would never forgive me, and this would be the end of our friendship. I remember staring straight in front of me at the windscreen, seeing nothing of the flying road, my ear still tingling with that spoken word. The silence became minutes, and the minutes became miles, and everything is over now, I thought. I shall never drive with him again. Tomorrow he'll go away, and Mrs. Van Hopper will be up again. She and I will walk along the terrace as we did before. The porter will bring down his trunks. I shall catch a glimpse of them in the luggage lift, with new plastered labels. The bustle and finality of departure, the sound of the car changing gear as it turned the corner, and then even that sound merging into the common traffic and being lost and so absorbed forever.
I was so deep in my picture, I even saw the porter pocketing his tip and going back through the swing door of the hotel, saying something over his shoulder to the commissioner that I did not notice the slowing down of the car, and it was only when we stopped, drawing up by the side of the road, that I brought myself back to the present once again. He sat motionless, looking without his hat and with his white scarf around his head, more than ever like someone medieval who lived within a frame. He didn't belong to the bright landscape. He should be standing on the steps of a gaunt cathedral, his cloak flung back while a beggar at his feet scrambled for gold coins. The friend had gone with his kindliness and his easy camaraderie, and the brother too, who had mocked me for nibbling at my nails. This man was a stranger. I wondered why I was sitting beside him in the car. Then he turned to me and spoke. A little while ago you talked about an invention, he said, some scheme for capturing a memory. You would like, you told me, at a chosen moment, to live the past again. I'm afraid I think rather differently from you. All memories are bitter, and I prefer to ignore them. Something happened a year ago that altered my whole life, and I want to forget every phase in my existence up to that time. Those days are finished. They are blotted out. I must begin living all over again. The first day we met, your Mrs. Van Hopper asked me why I came to Monte Carlo. It put a stopper on those memories you would like to resurrect. It doesn't always work, of course. Sometimes the scent is too strong for the bottle, and too strong for me. And then the devil in one, like a furtive peeping Tom, tries to draw the cork. I did that in the first drive we took together, when we climbed the hills and looked down over the precipice. I was there some years ago, with my wife. You asked me if it was still the same, if it had changed at all. It was just the same, but I was thankful to realise, oddly impersonal. There was no suggestion of the other time. She and I had left no record. It, it may have been because you were with me. You have blotted out the past for me, you know, far more effectively than all the bright lights of Monte Carlo. But for you, I should have left long ago, gone on to Italy and Greece, and further still, perhaps. You have spared me all those wanderings. Damn your puritanical little tight-lipped speech to me. Damn your idea of my kindness and my charity. I ask you to come with me, because I want you and your company. And if you don't believe me, you can leave the car now and find your own way home. Go on, open the door and get out. I sat still my hands in my lap, not knowing whether he meant it or not. Well, he said, what are you going to do about it? Had I been a year or two younger, I think I should have cried. Children's tears are very near the surface and come at the first crisis. As it was, I felt them prick behind my eyes, felt the ready colour flood my face, and catching a sudden glimpse of myself in the glass above the windscreen, saw in full the sorry spectacle that I had made, with troubled eyes and scarlet cheeks, lank hair flopping under a broad felt hat. I, I want to go home, I said, my voice perilously near to trembling, and without a word he started up the engine, let in the clutch and turned the car around the way we had come. Swiftly we covered the ground, far too swiftly, I thought, far too easily, and the callous countryside watched us with indifference. We came to the bend in the road that I had wished to imprison as a memory, and the peasant girl was gone, and the colour was flat, and it was no more after all than any bend in any road passed by a hundred motorists. The glamour of it had gone with my happy mood, and at the thought of it my frozen face quivered into feeling, my adult pride was lost, and those despicable tears rejoicing at their conquest welled into my eyes and strayed upon my cheeks. I could not check them, for they came unbidden, and had I reached in my pocket for a handkerchief, he would have seen. I must let them fall untouched and suffer the bitter salt upon my lips, plumbing the depths of humiliation. Whether he had turned his head to look at me, I do not know, for I watched the road ahead with blurred and steady stare, but suddenly he put out his hand, took hold of mine, and kissed it still saying nothing, and then threw his handkerchief on my lap. 
which I was too ashamed to touch. I thought of all those heroines of fiction who looked pretty when they cried, and what a contrast I must make with blotched and swollen face and red rims to my eyes. It was a dismal finish to my morning, and the day that stretched ahead of me was long. I had to lunch with Mrs. Van Hopper in her room because the nurse was going out, and afterwards she would make me play bezique with all the tireless energy of the convalescent. I knew I should stifle in that room. There was something sordid about the tumbled sheets, the sprawling blankets, and the thumped pillows, and that bedside table dusty with powder, spilt scent, and melting liquid rouge. A bed would be littered with the separated sheets of the daily papers folded anyhow, while French novels with curling edges and the covers torn kept company with American magazines. The mashed stubs of cigarettes lay everywhere in cleansing cream in a dish of grapes and on the floor beneath the bed. Visitors were lavish with their flowers, and the vases stood cheek by jowl in any fashion, hot house exotics crammed beside mimosa, while a great beribboned casket crowned them all with tier upon tier of crystallised fruit. Later her friends would come in for a drink, which I must mix for them, hating my task, shy and ill at ease in my corner, hemmed in by their parrot chatter, and I would be the whipping boy again, blushing for her when, excited by her little crowd, she must sit up in bed and talk too loudly, laugh too long, reach to the portable gramophone and start a record, shrugging her large shoulders to the tune. I preferred her irritable and snappy, with her hair done up in pins, scolding me for forgetting her taxol. All this awaited me in the suite, while he, once he had left me at the hotel, would go away somewhere alone, towards the sea perhaps, feel the wind on his cheek, follow the sun, and it might happen that he would lose himself in those memories that I knew nothing of, that I could not share. He would wander down the years that were gone. The gulf that lay between us was wider now than it had ever been, and he stood away from me with his back turned on the further shore. I felt young and small, and very much alone, and now, in spite of my pride, I found his handkerchief and blew my nose, throwing my drab appearance to the winds. It could never matter. To hell with this, he said, suddenly, as though angry, as though bored, and he pulled me beside him and put his arm around my shoulder, still looking straight ahead of him, his right hand on the wheel. He drove, I remember, even faster than before. I suppose you are young enough to be my daughter, and I don't know how to deal with you, he said. The road narrowed then to a corner, and he had to swerve to avoid a dog. I thought he would release me, but he went on holding me beside him, and when the corner was passed and the road came straight again, he did not let me go. You can forget all I said to you this morning, he said. That's all finished and done with. Don't let's ever think of it again. My family always call me Maxim. I'd like you to do the same. You've been formal with me long enough. He felt for the brim of my hat and took hold of it, throwing it over his shoulder to the back seat, and then bent down and kissed the top of my head. Promise me you'll never wear black satin, he said. I smiled then, and he laughed back at me. And the morning was gay again. The morning was a shining thing. Mrs. Van Hopper and the afternoon did not matter a flip of the finger. It would pass so quickly, and it would be tonight and another day tomorrow I was cocksure, jubilant. At that moment I almost had the courage to claim equality. I saw myself strolling into Mrs. Van Hopper's bedroom rather late for my bezique, and when questioned by her, yawning carelessly, saying, I forgot the time, I've been lunching with Maxim. I was still child enough to consider a Christian name like a plume in the hat, though from the very first he had called me by mine. The morning for all its shadowed moments, had promoted me to a new level of friendship. I did not lag so far behind as I had thought. He kissed me, too, a natural business, comforting and quiet, not dramatic as in books, not embarrassing. It seemed to bring about an ease in our relationship. It made everything more simple. The gulf between us had been bridged after all. I was to call him Maxim. And that afternoon playing bezique with Mrs. Van Hopper was not so tedious as it might have been, though my courage failed me 
and I said nothing of my mourning, for when gathering her cards together at the end and reaching for the box, she said casually, Tell me, is Max de Winter still in the hotel? I hesitated a moment like a diver on the brink, then lost my nerve and my tutored self-possession, saying, Yes, I, I believe so. He comes into the restaurant for his meals. Someone has told her, I thought. Someone has seen us together. The tennis professional has complained. The manager has sent a note, and I waited for her attack. But she went on putting the cards back into the box, yawning a little, while I straightened the tumbled bed. I gave her the bowl of powder, the rouge compact, and the lipstick, and she put away the cards and took up the hand glass from the table by her side. Attractive creature, she said, but queer-tempered, I should think. Difficult to know. I thought he might have made some gesture of asking one to Mandalay that day in the lounge, but he was very close. I said nothing. I watched her pick up the lipstick and outline a bow upon her hard mouth. I never saw her, she said, holding the glass away to see the effect, but I believe she was very lovely, exquisitely turned out, and brilliant in every way. They used to give tremendous parties at Mandalay. It was all very sudden and tragic, and I believe he adored her. I need the darker shade of powder of this brilliant red, my dear. Fetch it, will you, and put this box back in the drawer? And we were busy then with powder, scent, and rouge until the bell rang and her visitors came in. I handed them their drinks, dully, saying little. I changed the records and the gramophone. I threw away the stubs of cigarettes. Been doing any sketching lately, little lady? The forced heartiness of an old banker, his monocle dangling on a string, and my bright smile of insincerity. No, not very lately. Will you have another cigarette? It was not I that answered. I was not there at all. I was following a phantom in my mind whose shadowy form had taken shape at last. Her features were blurred, her colouring indistinct. The setting of her eyes and the texture of her hair was still uncertain, still to be revealed. She had beauty that endured and a smile that was not forgotten. Somewhere her voice still lingered and the memory of her words. There were places she had visited and things she had touched. Perhaps in cupboards there were clothes that she had worn with the scent about them still. In my bedroom, under my pillow, I had a book that she had taken in her hands, and I could see her turning to that first white page, smiling as she wrote and shaking the bent nib. Max, from Rebecca. It must have been his birthday, and she had put it amongst her other presents on the breakfast table, and they had laughed together as he tore off the paper and string. She leant, perhaps, over his shoulder while he read, Max. She liked to call him Max. It was familiar, gay, and easy on the tongue. The family could call him Maxim if they liked. Grandmothers and aunts. And people like myself, quiet and dull and useful, did not matter. Max was her choice. The word was her possession. She had written it with so great a confidence on the flyleaf of that book. That bold, slanting hand stabbing the white paper, the symbol of herself so certain, so assured. How many times she must have written to him thus, in how many varied moods, little notes scrawled on half sheets of paper, and letters when he was away, page after page, intimate, their news, her voice echoing through the house and down the garden, careless and familiar like the writing in the book, and I had to call him Maxim. Thank you.